everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Goldman. I'm a partner in the Supreme Court and Appellate Practice at ORIC and a member of the ACS Bay Area Board of Directors. Thank you all for joining us this <laughs> afternoon. Our plan is going to be to focus on five of the most significant cases that the court decided um, in the past term that ended just this morning. They all have in common that they were led by members of our local Bay Area and ACS communities. And so um, I'll just note that ACS National is going to be hosting a broader term and review event on July 22nd. So please keep an eye out for an announcement about that. That'll cover some of the other cases that we don't get to cover today, but that means that today we get to dive deep into the handful of cases that members of our community were deeply involved in. So I'll be asking each of our panelists to give a brief overview of their case, talk about some of the strategic decisions that went behind the litigation, and also talk about what the result in the case is going to mean going forward. And then we're gonna to try to save some time at the end for your questions. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to post those. You can do that at any time and then we'll collect those for the very end. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our panelists today. Erwin Chemerinsky is the Dean of Berkeley Law and a member of the ACS National Board of Directors. Pam Carlin and Jeff Fisher are both professors at Stanford Law School, uh, where they co-direct the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic and serve as faculty advisors of the Stanford ACS chapter. Pam is also a member of the ACS National Board of Directors. Araceli martinez Olguin is supervising attorney with the National Immigration Law Center and a member of the ACS Bay Area Chapter Board. And Mike Mongan is the Solicitor General of California in the California Department of Justice. And so we'll start off with three consolidated cases that the court heard involving challenges to the Trump administration's rescission of the DACA program. Araceli and Mike were counsel in two of those cases and Mike also argued the case in the Supreme Court. So I will ask them to tell us about the case. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you'll see that Mike and I will be passing the mic back and forth to each other within our time limits. Uh, so I'm kicking us off. Um, just a word about the National Immigration Law Center because my development folks make me do this. Um, so right, we at the National Immigration Law Center have dedicated the last 19 years to supporting immigrant youth in their efforts to have their humanity and dignity recognized under the law. We worked on campaigns to stop the deportations of immigrant youth and helped to draft the first DREAM Act back in 2001. And we've since led many legislative campaigns to achieve the DREAM Act over the years. But as you know, the DREAM Act has never managed to pass the Senate. So the immigrants' rights movement shifted away from a purely legislative strategy. And in 2012, at a time when immigrant youth, their loved ones, and so many of our community members were being detained and deported in record numbers, the movement led by immigrant youth fought to persuade the Obama administration to direct the Department of Homeland Security to grant deferred action and deprioritize immigrant youth who met certain criteria. This became what we call Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. DACA provides temporary reprieve from deportation and the ability to apply for work authorization as well as eligibility for Social Security and Medicare and some collateral state benefits like driver's licenses. Uh, however, it offers no permanent protection or a means to acquire citizenship. And in the way that one executive uh, administration instituted DACA, another can dismantle it. Enter the Trump administration. Um, in 2017, then Attorney General Sessions wrote a letter to Secretary Elaine Duke, uh, Secretary for the Department of Homeland Security, advising her that, he, that the Attorney General Sessions had concluded that DACA was unlawful and advising that DHS should rescind DACA. On the basis of that one-page letter and its conclusory assertions about DACA's lawfulness, uh, the following day, Secretary Duke issued a memo terminating DACA. Within days of the announcement, a wide variety of stakeholders in more than 10 cases filed suits challenging the Trump administration's termination. Between January 2018 and June 2020, orders from three federal district courts, the first emanating from the Northern District of California, later from the Eastern District of New York, the case in which Nilk is counsel, and the district court in DC, uh, kept DACA partially in place by requiring USCIS to continue accepting DACA applications from previous DACA recipients. Uh, 
as you know, and this is where I'll hand it over to Mike in a moment, the Trump administration appealed all of those rulings. I'd like to pause and note that since the, uh, since the issuance of the injunctions to the present day, 826,000 uh, DACA applications have been approved for renewal. Thanks, Otiseli. So that brings us to the Supreme Court litigation. So the Trump administration did appeal. They were unsuccessful in the Ninth Circuit. Um, the appeals were pending in the Second Circuit and the D.C. Circuit, and they filed petitions for cert before judgment. And then in June 19, uh, June 2019, the Supreme Court finally decided to take up the DACA case. And as Araceli indicated, really, they decided to take up pretty much all of the DACA cases, with a few exceptions. The court granted three separate cert petitions. They related to nine different lawsuits in California, New York, and D.C., and those suits were brought by 45 different plaintiffs, including a dozen uh, individual DACA recipients and 20 sovereign states. And they were litigated by more lawyers than you can shake a stick at, including Adesali, myself, Dean Chemerinsky, uh, Kelsey Helland of the ACS Bay Area Board, and literally scores of others. Uh, and the court gave us all collectively a total of 30 minutes of oral argument time. So this presents a great case study in how to take a collaborative approach to Supreme Court litigation. And candidly, that always presents um, some challenges, but I think that this group of respondents really rose to the occasion. One of the first things we did was to establish a steering committee so that we had a smaller group that could talk about some of the big issues and decision points like briefing schedules and our approach to oral argument. Um, I think we all understood the value of frequent communication on strategic issues and things like amicus coordination. And we also respected that we had many different parties, that sometimes they were going to have different views, different institutional interests on certain issues. And we knew we were going to be filing multiple briefs and they didn't have to be identical, but we did try very hard to coordinate and make sure that those briefs were complementary and not undercutting each other. And I think the ultimate decision from the court was really a vindication of that collaborative effort. So as the cases came up to the court, there were really two main legal issues. First, the court had to decide whether the agency's decision to terminate DACA was subject to judicial review at all, or whether it fell within the Administrative Procedure Act's exception for actions that are, quote, committed to agency discretion by law. And second, if the action was reviewable, the court had to decide whether it violated the APA because it was arbitrary and capricious or contrary to law. Now, the lower courts in our cases had uniformly held that the action was reviewable, and they had all held that the agency either violated or likely violated the APA, but on different theories. Some courts held that the agency's action was based on an incorrect legal conclusion. They just flat out disagreed with Attorney General Sessions' assertion that DACA was unlawful. Other courts didn't reach that question, and they reasoned that the agency failed to give an adequate explanation for why it chose to end DACA, including because it didn't really explain the basis for its legal conclusion and because it didn't address the profound reliance interest that had built up around the DACA program since 2012. Now, as attorneys, we obviously spent a ton of time thinking about what arguments might resonate with the court, and particularly with the Chief Justice, who appeared to be the most likely fifth vote. We knew we had to offer a forceful explanation for why DACA is lawful, but we also recognized that the more likely path to a victory here was to persuade a majority of the court that this particular decisional process and the explanation offered were simply inadequate, regardless of their views on DACA or its legality. So turning to the oral argument, we ended up getting permission from the court to divide our time between Ted Olson on behalf of the private plaintiffs and myself on behalf of California and the many other state plaintiffs. And the argument was interesting. It was challenging. Uh, the court was hard to read, but very engaged throughout. Uh, there were tough questions on both reviewability and the APA merits. Not a lot of questions about DACA's legality, but a lot of attention paid to the reliance interests surrounding the DACA program. 
And coming out of it, if you read the news coverage, uh, I think most commentators, it's fair to say, were pretty pessimistic about our chances of, of getting that fifth vote. And then on June 18th, we got the court's decision. Uh, the decision was a 5-4 decision with the Chief Justice writing the opinion for the court, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. And the court sided with us on the core APA issues. First, it held that the agency's action was subject to judicial review. It rejected the federal government's argument that this was the same thing as a decision not to institute enforcement proceedings, which is unreviewable under the Supreme Court's decision in Heckler against Cheney. The court said, no, this is different. DACA itself is not a particular non-enforcement decision. And even if you can view it as a non-enforcement policy, it's more than just that because it confers affirmative immigration relief and benefits on uh, DACA recipients. And then the court held that the agency violated the APA because it failed to consider important aspects of the problem before it. Although Attorney General Sessions had asserted that DACA was unlawful, the agency didn't consider the other available alternatives to address that problem short of terminating the whole program. So for example, the court said that the agency could have considered modifying the specific benefits that Sessions identified as legally problematic. And the court also said that the agency failed to address the important reliance interests that DACA recipients and their families in particular had developed around this policy. Now going forward, the decision certainly does leave the door open to the possibility that the administration could try and make a new decision to terminate DACA, but the immediate effect of the judgment was to vacate the agency's 2017 termination of DACA, and that means to restore the pre-existing DACA program. So I've been mainly focusing on the lawyers and the legal briefs and the opinions, um, but this is really a case where that is only part of the story. There was also a tremendous organizing effort by thousands of DACA recipients and others, and I want to turn it back to Arasali now to, uh, to talk a bit about that. All right, folks, so I will pick it up uh, there and sort of start from a place to bridge to bridge everything that's happening in the briefs and, and in the cases uh, by just sort of pausing to comment the fact uh, that, then I think this was Melissa Murray on strict scrutiny this morning, right? The APA is doing a yeoman's job, this administration, right? And that's important for the organizing piece only because, right, since this is proceeding before the Supreme Court, Primarily, and we're actually hoping, right, that it that it really is just the administration. Uh, excuse me, the the justices are sort of rest their ruling on the APA. That tells us that that we are going to have to keep to doing more in the world and in the movement to get any sort of more fuller, more fulsome relief for immigrant youth. And so as this is going from the day that cert is granted to the day of oral argument and a little bit and then beyond as well what a number of us are doing is looking to create moments within within the world and within the movement to hang on to as we march forward as we go. And so what I want to reflect for you all a little bit about is the creation of the Home is Here campaign. Um, I've got my little branded my little branded piece there, right? But this very simple idea that home is here for DACA recipients and then making sure that what we're doing is keeping the stories of documented folks at the forefront for people through social media content, through videos that we had, we're finding ways in which we're also just bringing people together. Um, and I want to sort of pause and also note and, and thank Mike and I would Ted if you were here, but like right at one point we brought together uh, again, in the effort to make community, because these folks are going to have to keep working and fighting together, we brought together all of the plaintiffs across all of the cases, as well as the declarants in the cases, to meet, to have time with Mike and with Ted, to, because they're the ones that are going to represent them in front of the court. And we also made tremendous efforts to ensure that on the day of oral argument, in addition to the rally that was going on outside the court, that there would be space, literal seats for DACA recipients in the gallery out of the public line that day. And I just want to note personally just how meaningful it was to be sitting in an oral argument that day and look over and see all of my clients and the other and the other DACA recipients and a couple of their moms in there listening 
to to the whole to all of the argument. Um, it also should go mention. It also can't. Uh, I also should mention just the tremendous amicus coordination that was required by this case. I know this is true for many of the cases here, but in this instance right there were we were it resulted in lots of work and then lots of also as you can imagine lots of asking folks to consolidate their messages um but still we we had um more than three dozen amicus briefs i want to pause and also give a hat tip to mary kelly pearson from the bay area from the acs bay area lawyers chapter board she also she authored a brief and i saw her at argument that day um, and those amicus briefs were signed by more than 1500 individuals organizations and entities right there's there's a large way in which this case as much as it belonged to lots of lawyers right there were lots of us uh, working on the case it, it really does belong so much more to the hundreds of thousands of DACA recipients and their families. And, you know, part, and that's part of the reason that efforts were made both to get them into the courtroom and then significantly, if you all haven't seen the footage, I'll, I'll try and share it out in some way, but right, that, that scene and view of the recipients emerging together, all the documented folks emerging together from, you know, coming down, descending the steps of the Supreme Court to a large rally chanting for them that home is here. And, you know, and it really was a matter of trying to work with everyone, including all, you know, there are lots of AGs there and Ted for that matter, and them all agreeing very graciously that when you get to the gaggle, you let DACA recipients speak first. Because if Ted speaks, if Mike speaks, if Attorney General Becerra speaks, the reporters will take their quote and run. And they all very graciously instead said, no, no, agreed. Yes, let's put up some DACA recipients who can pause and say what this day means to them. Um, and so with that, I just wanna leave you, I guess, with the, with the reflection of how important it is in these big cases, knowing that they are part of bigger things um, to create moments and create community with, with, for the folks that, the, that are impacted by these cases. Great, well, thank you both and congratulations on the really tremendous victory and advocacy in that case. Um, so we're gonna move now to another trio of cases that were decided together, also um, involving a broad coalition and collaboration. Uh, three cases about protecting LGBT employees from discrimination. Pam argued uh, the case on behalf of two employees who were fired because they were gay, and I will let you take it from there, Pam. Thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. Um, I should just say one thing before I begin, which is what a delight it is to be on a panel with all of you. Um, two of you, Brian and Mike, were actually uh, students in our clinic in earlier years. And um, one of the real pleasures of doing these cases is doing them in the clinic with obviously Jeff as one of my co-directors. Um, so these three cases that got combined at the Supreme Court involved two gay men and a transgender woman uh, who were each fired from their job and who claimed that they were fired in violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says that you can't discriminate against an employee uh, because of such individual sex, as well as the person's race or national origin or religion. Um, and one of the interesting things about these cases is that in recent years, um, as the kind of textualist movement has grown with the Supreme Court so that they all now say that they're textualists rather than thinking about the purpose behind a statute or general policy, uh, a majority of judges on lower federal courts who had addressed these questions had decided that um, firing somebody for being gay was a form of sex discrimination or firing somebody for being transgender was a form of sex discrimination. And the Supreme Court sat around for quite a while trying to decide whether it was going to take these cases. And ultimately it took the cases. And as Mike said, sometimes when you have a bunch of cases taken at once, there are complications that come from the side that the various parties are on. And what the court did, because it granted one case where the gay employee had won in the Court of Appeals and one case where the gay employee had lost was they had to realign the parties. And so that gave us um, a little bit of an advantage because even though we were the respondents, we got an opening brief and a reply brief. And that turned out to be quite important because the arguments that were made at the Supreme Court were done much more effectively and had a much kind of broader resonance than the way the cases had been argued uh, in the courts of appeals. And so it was lucky for us that we got to see the arguments that the Solicitor General was going to make on behalf of the United States in support of the employers and got an opportunity 
uh, to respond to those arguments. So we had two hours of oral argument in front of the court in the cases. And I should say my client, um, uh, Don Zarda, had died before the case began. And as some of you may know, um, Amy Stevens, who is the transgender woman in the uh, transgender discrimination case, died while the case was pending. So by the time the case was decided by the Supreme Court, uh, only one of the three plaintiffs was still alive. Um, uh, the oral argument, we had two hours of oral argument at the Supreme Court, and, um, you know, our, we had several different theories. Uh, we were giving the court essentially a menu of theories for why this was sex discrimination. One was to go with a straight textual argument. In our case, it was, um, if you simply change Don Zarda's sex or you change Brian Bostock's sex, and they were women who wanted to date men, and women who were sexually attracted to men rather than men who were sexually attracted, they would never have been fired from their job. And so that was sex discrimination, pure and simple. Uh, the argument in the transgender case was if Amy Stevens' birth certificate had said she was a girl at birth rather than saying she was a boy at birth, she never would have been fired from her job. So that was our first theory. It was just a plain text theory. Our second theory was a theory that was based on the Supreme Court sex stereotyping cases. And we said it is a normative stereotype about men that they should be attracted only to women. And it's a normative stereotype about women that they should be attracted uh, only to men. Uh, and then our third theory um, uh, rested on loving against Virginia, which had said it was race discrimination to fire somebody for being an interracial relationship. And we said, if it's race discrimination to fire somebody for being in an interracial relationship, that is because their race is not the same as the race of their partner, then surely it's sex discrimination to fire somebody for being in a relationship because their sex is the same as the sex of their partner. So those were our theories. Um, at, at the oral argument, I think the, there were a couple of things that I noticed at the oral argument. Um, one was, uh, and we were still arguing in front of a court that you could see, as opposed to the May argument session. Um, one was that um, a number of the justices seemed obsessed with questions about bathrooms. Um, and that seemed especially odd in my case. I was arguing just a case about sexual orientation because, of course, no one had ever suggested that gay men shouldn't be using the men's room and lesbians shouldn't be using the women's bathroom. But they kept asking me these questions. And finally, at one point, I just said, you know, you really ought to ask somebody about this who's got a client who's transgender because that's where the bathroom issue really comes up. It doesn't come up in the context of gay rights. And so it was interesting to see that the court really had elided. We had always assumed that when they granted certiorari in two cases, one set of cases involving gay plaintiffs and the other involving a transgender plaintiff, that they would separate out the issues of dress codes and bathrooms and the like, which have arisen in cases involving transgender plaintiffs, but have never arisen in cases involving gay, lesbian, or bisexual plaintiffs. But they really did seem to elide the two. And so we ended up with two hours of oral argument, much of which seemed quite uh, similar. That is, it seemed quite repetitive after a while. They seemed to be asking the same questions uh, again and again. Um, coming out of the oral argument, um, I felt uh, optimistic about our chances, um, in part because Justice Gorsuch, who ultimately wrote the opinion for the court, uh, said to David uh, Cole, who was arguing the case uh, on behalf of Amy Stevens, look, I grant you the text really supports your side, but shouldn't we be worried about the tremendous social disruption that would come from recognizing uh, non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity? Um, and I thought that was a really hopeful sign for us because um, he had recently written a book where he basically said, look at the text. And when people tell you to look at something else, go back to rule number one, which is look at the text. Um, so I felt coming out of the argument quite optimistic about Three days before the, argue, before the decision came down, I was on the phone with one of the Supreme Court reporters who said to me, you do know you're going to lose, right? And that made me kind of worried and pessimistic because I figured this is a reporter who has a real ear to the ground and something bad's going to happen. And then the morning that the decisions came down, um, the Supreme Court's website crashed. Um, and so you knew the decision had come down, but you couldn't get the decision to load. And I think the reason for this was in part that Justice Alito's dissent 
has this huge appendix to it. It's about 50 pages that it's a facsimile of documents from the 19, 1960s. And I think that that may have just crashed the, the court's website. So you kept hitting refresh and refresh and refresh and it took, uh, it took about five or six minutes before we could get the first page of the opinion. And the first page told us uh, that, we had, that we had won the case. Um, so in thinking about going forward, what does the case mean? Um, it, one thing it means is as a statutory matter, there are a ton of federal non-discrimination statutes that say you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And I assume because the court here relied solely on the textual argument in, in reaching its conclusion, that that means that all of those statutes also now cover sexual orientation uh, and gender identity. The other question is where this goes as a matter of constitutional law, because the Supreme Court has traditionally applied a form of heightened scrutiny, intermediate heightened scrutiny, to discrimination on the basis of sex. And so that, I think, will uh, mean that uh, constitutional claims now involving express sexual orientation discrimination or gender identity discrimination probably should get some form of heightened review as well. At the same time, the court left two big issues open, one of which I think will lead into what Jeff's going to talk about next. Um, the two issues that the court left open was the court, after asking us a million questions about bathrooms and dress codes, said, we're not going to answer any questions about bathrooms or dress codes. Um, I think those are issues that can be easily dealt with. Among other things, there are very few dress codes left that are uh, really sex-based. If you look at the reported cases on sex-based uh, dress codes, they're almost all from 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the other thing it left open is what do we do about religious objectors to non-discrimination for uh, gay people or non-discrimination for transgender people? Um, and here, I think the court kicked the can down the road, but not very far because um, only a couple, of, a couple of weeks later, the court started to address this question of uh, religious objectors, culturally conservative religious objectors to the government's policies of non-discrimination and equal treatment. Um, and there we're seeing a court that's probably as pro-religion as any court uh, in our history. So I'll stop there um, and kick it back to you, Brian. Thanks, Pam. And so Ed, as you mentioned uh, the case that Jeff, the first of the two cases that Jeff argued that uh, we'll talk about was Our Lady of Guadalupe School, which he argued on behalf of the plaintiffs. And it did seem like that was in some ways the other shoe dropping after Bostock yesterday. This was a case in which the court expanded uh, the definition of, or the scope of the ministerial exception. So Jeff, can you tell us about that? Uh, sure, I'm happy to. And uh... Uh, thanks uh, for Pam for a perfect little handoff there. And, and Brian, as you mentioned, um, this was a case the court decided actually yesterday morning. So uh, the wounds are still a little fresh, um, but I'm going to do my best to uh, put it in context for all of you. Um, so as Pam said, um, you know, her, her argument uh, in, in Bostock uh, was in October. Uh, and then later on um, in December, in fact, the court granted this case uh, these two cases, in fact, and, the, and, um, and, and then I stepped in. Uh, so the cases, are, so I think they're maybe the best way to um, set them up is to start with the exchange that I think Pam had with the justices, which was, what do we do about religious employers who have an objection? And I think one of the answers Pam quite rightly gave is, well, there's the ministerial exception to our nation's civil rights laws, um, employment discrimination laws, that is, uh, that would be available, uh, at least to some degree in those circumstances. And so that's what that's what my cases were about. Um, in 2012, the court decided a case called Hosanna Tabor uh, that adopted this term called the ministerial exception, this doctrine uh, called the ministerial exception. And this is something the lower courts themselves had worked out um, over, over several decades before. Uh, and the basic idea behind the doctrine is that the First Amendment religion clauses, and the court has said both of the religion clauses are in play here, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, uh, give religious organizations some breathing space to hire and fire their spiritual leaders, uh, so their clergy and the like. Uh, and I think everybody, I think, would agree that there's a, there's a powerful and sensible intuition behind the basic notion of the doctrine, which is uh, it's hard to establish a religion and be 
uh, free to exercise it if you can't choose who your leaders are uh, without intrusion and regulation from the government. And so that's the basic idea. And in the 2012 case, what the court said is that the ministerial exception uh, uh, protected uh, a religious school, a Lutheran school, uh, from being sued by one of its teachers for employment discrimination. Uh, and the court said that teacher was an ordained minister in the Lutheran church. And so because of that title and of her duties of teaching religion to the next generation and her special training to do that, uh, she fell within the ministerial exception. Uh, and so in the cases that I was involved in, uh, both arise out of Los Angeles, and they raise the first which it, of what I think is going to be a series of cases the court's going to end up deciding, uh, involving how broad the ministerial exception, in fact, is. Um, and I represented two fifth grade teachers uh, who worked in Catholic schools in Los Angeles. Um, and so they taught the general curriculum that a fifth grade teacher does. They taught reading, writing, arithmetic, but they also taught 40 minute modules of religion most days, and also uh, led the students occasionally in prayer and walked them back and forth to mass and that sort of thing. And the Ninth Circuit, hearing these two cases separately, uh, held that the two teachers were not ministers uh, because, yes, they taught a little bit of religion as part of their duties, but overall they were roughly equivalent to teachers in public schools and other secular private schools. Um, and they didn't have any special training or title. They were what is sometimes referred to as lay teachers uh, who just happened to teach in religious schools. And so those two cases, uh, the court granted in December and took, to, took up together. Um, and so our position in front of the justices was that the ministerial exception needs to be kept narrow. It needs to be kept narrow because, uh, because it's such powerful medicine. Uh, it's an absolute immunity for suit for religious employers. So it's not just that they have a free pass to hire and fire people for religious reasons. The idea behind the doctrine is they can hire and fire people for any reason whatsoever, including rank odious discriminatory reasons, uh, as long as they are clergy or otherwise uh, falling within this ministerial exception, uh, because uh, that is just such a radioactive space for the courts to enter. And so we thought, given how powerful that is, uh, it would be it would be really problematic and subject to manipulation to let, uh, to let it get much more expanded. The response from the schools, uh, represented by the Beckett Fund and ultimately the Solicitor General who sided with them, uh, was that you can't have the ministerial exception focused just on things like titles and formal designations. It needs to be a functional doctrine uh, that really gives religious employers protections for any of their employees who perform re important religious duties. And What's more, they said, when you ask whether they're performing important religious duties, uh, you should basically defer to the religious, religious organizations themselves uh, and not become entangled in those kinds of religious questions as to what is important to those religious employers. Uh, so a very, very expansive concept of the ministerial exception, both in theory and, and in practice. And what the court decided yesterday uh, by a seven to two vote uh, was that the teachers in my case were in fact uh, covered by the ministerial exception. Uh, but the court, in an opinion by Justice Alito, uh, I think in some ways wrote a narrow opinion. Um, the basic thrust in the opinion, and this could be why it was a seven justice majority and not a smaller majority, uh, the basic thrust of the opinion is that whatever else the ministerial exception might cover, people who teach religion to the next generation, people who are charged with teaching the faith, even if it's only part of the day and part of their job, that is such a fundamentally important uh, part of establishing a religion uh, that uh, those people need to be exempted from ordinary employment laws. Uh, and the court basically left open whether other teachers who teach at uh, a religious school, like a high school or a college, but teach only secular subjects, uh, or other kinds of employees like nurses in Catholic hospitals or counselors at summer camps who may work for religious employers but do some some, um, some uh, teaching of the faith or, or, um, I, I, or, or just engagement on, re on religious matters with, uh, with customers or uh, campers or whatever it might be, whether those people would be uh, falling within the ministerial exception. Uh, so uh, the two dissenters were Justices Sotomayor uh, and Justice Ginsburg, who said uh, they were already getting off the, getting off the train here and that um, even going from Hosanna Tabor to this case was going too far.
And so in some ways, the cases, is, the cases are raising more questions than they're answering still for the future. Uh, and, and, and this really does hook up again with, with, with Bostock in particular, which is if you look online at a lot of the literature and a lot of the conversation about the ministerial exception, it is, it is especially focused on, uh, on gay and transgender employees and whatever rights they may have for working for uh, religious employers. Uh, so that's what's left to be decided in the future. And let me just say a couple things and then I'll hand it back to Brian uh, that I think are worth watching. Uh, so one is, uh, it's just worth remembering that uh, these cases are constitutional cases. They are cases where the court is actually holding unconstitutional decisions that Congress deliberately made and the state legislatures have deliberately made about the scope of their employment laws. Uh, and what's more, they're doing it uh, with the blessing at the moment of the federal government going in and arguing against the constitutionality of their own laws. Uh, and so that was pretty dramatic. Um, and so one thing to watch is just whether the government sticks with that view or after another election might take a different view. Um, that view is also in the teeth of what the government itself had argued for decades uh, in the lower courts. And as I said, achieved a body of case law that was uh, favorable to my clients until yesterday. Uh, so that'll be something to watch just how the political actors and how the public understands these cases in terms of the, co the court's really muscular uh, assertion of authority here. Uh, the next thing that'll be really challenging, I think, is, is what the court is going to do when religious organizations come in, and it really is going to be a when, when they come in and argue that all these other employees like nurses and, 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 and people who work in publisher, publishing houses and even their lawyers, perhaps, are ministers in their view, in their faith, and are, are, and are performing important religious functions. Because the court, on the one hand, seems to want to say that teaching religion is so special, maybe it can be carved off from other things. But on the other hand, the court has signaled in many other First Amendment cases involving the religion clauses that the court shouldn't be deciding what is central to a religion and what is especially important to a religion and the rest. So the court is sort of heading for a, uh, for a really difficult uh, problem. And then the last thing I'll say is that in another way, the court is heading for a difficult, difficult problem with respect to another case that we're not talking about today that was decided this term, the Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue case, uh, where the court decided five to four that when the, when, when the government sets up a program to give aid to, uh, to secular private schools, they have to basically give the same aid to religious private schools. Uh, and, the, and the four Democratic appointees dissented saying, wait a minute, religious education is special and is especially important in propagating a religion. But the conservatives didn't seem to think it was, special, it was so special it needed to be treated differently. So again, the way the court is going to try to fit together where it's going in the Espinoza religious aid line of cases with the ministerial exception line of cases is going to be uh, something to watch in coming years. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And so staying with the theme of the court narrowing some anti-discrimination laws uh, this term, our next case is Comcast versus National Association of African-American Owned Media, which Irwin argued for the respondent. So Irwin. Thank you. It's such an honor to be part of this discussion. The case involved the federal civil rights statute 42 United States Code section 1981 was adopted as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and it prohibits race discrimination in contracting. It says that every person should have the same right to enter and have contracts enforced as quote, white citizens do. In terms of the facts, my client, Byron Allen, may be familiar to you. Maybe you've heard him perform. He owns the Weather Channel. But what this, this case was about was he owns seven cable channels. If you get Direct TV or Dish TV or Uverse, you get the Byron Allen channels. He went to Comcast and asked it to carry these seven channels, and they said no. They said he had to go through a number of steps in order to be considered. He spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to go through those steps, and then went back to Comcast. They said, sorry, we don't have any more bandwidth. In the meantime, they had begun carrying about 60 white-owned channels. There's some direct evidence of race discrimination. As the complaint alleges, an official of Comcast said to Byron Allen, quote, we don't want to create any more Bob Johnsons. Bob Johnson being the very successful head of the Black Entertainment Television Network. Byron sued in federal district court pursuant to section 1981. 
the district court, in a very short opinion and explanation, granted a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. I argued the case in the Ninth Circuit and prevailed. The Ninth Circuit said it's sufficient for Section 1981 to allege that race is a motivating factor, that Byron Allen's complaint alleged that race was a motivating factor, and so therefore the case should go back and it should proceed through discovery, summary judgment, maybe trial. Comcast sought cert in the Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to consider whether but for causation is required at the pleading stage, whether it's insufficient to just allege race is a motivating factor. There are many strategic choices in briefing and in arguing this case. One was to focus very much on precedent. In 1989, in Patterson versus McLean Credit, the Supreme Court clearly implied that it's enough under Section 1981 to allege that race is a motivating factor. There, the court said, once that's done, it shifts the burden to the defendant to show a non-race-based reason. Second, maybe most important, I wanted the court to see this as a case just about what needs to be alleged at the pleading stage. And the reason for this is somewhat complicated. Title VII allows for recovery with proof of race or sex as a motivating factor, but when that happens, recovery is limited by the statute. The concern that was raised by the other side, by Comcast and the Trump administration, was that if 1981 allowed race to be enough as a motivating factor, then no one would ever use Title VII in race cases. They would just circumvent the limits in Title VII. And the way I tried to get around this was saying, this is about the pleading stage, and race should be enough at that stage to shift the burden to the defense. This isn't about ultimately the proof stage. Also, there's a good deal of focus on tort law. As I said, this was a law adopted in 1866. So we got an amicus brief of tort law historians, John Witt at Yale, Mark Gergen at Berkeley, saying that but for causation didn't exist in any major way in 1866. It's really an innovation of the 20th century. And finally, we wanted to talk a lot about the consequences, how much harder it is to allege and prove that race is a but for causation as opposed to a motivating factor. All of these strategic choices failed, lost nine to nothing. Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion for the court. Justice Gorsuch said that it has to be presumed that all civil rights statutes were brought against the backdrop of but for causation. He says that it has to be both alleged in the pleadings and ultimately proven that race was the but for reason for the denial of contracts. Well, why does this case matter? What's likely to be the implications? First, it is much harder to allege and prove but for causation than race the motivating factor. Let me give an example. It's one that I used at oral argument in responding to Justice Sotomayor. Imagine an African-American individual goes to rent a hotel room and the proprietor says to the person, we don't have any rooms available. And besides, we don't rent to black people. Imagine that that person writes a complaint suing under Section 1981 for discrimination and contracting, alleging just those facts. That's certainly enough to allege that race is a motivating factor, but it doesn't show that race was the but-for cause for the denial of the contract. Often it's impossible at the pleading stage, prior to discovery, to be able to allege that race is the but-for cause. And so I think the Supreme Court has made the burden on civil rights plaintiffs much more difficult. And you can certainly see this by looking at the way the briefs were done in the case. Comcast, a major corporation, had a brief done by the Chamber of Commerce and of the Trump administration. On the other hand, every major civil rights organization wrote or signed briefs arguing that should be enough that race is a motivating factor. Second, this is likely to have implications for other civil rights statutes as well. Justice Gorsuch's opinion is written in broad language and says that unless Congress specifies otherwise, it has to be assumed in civil rights law that Congress wanted but for causation. And so it's not just about Section 1981. There's some statutes like Title VII that are specific in terms of motivating factor language but generally civil rights statutes, 
like Section 1981, are silent with regard to the issue of causation. Finally, I think the case is important in rejecting any distinction between the pleading and the proof stage. I intentionally tried to make this case narrow and say this is just about what has to be pled to be able to shift the burden of proof. I tried to rely on precedent, as I said, Patterson versus McLean. Justice Gorsuch's opinion doesn't even mention the precedent, let alone try to distinguish it. And Justice Gorsuch is explicit that the requirement for but-for causation exists both at the complaint stage, the pleadings, as well as ultimately the proof. The court said there's to be no distinction between these two stages. And this too is gonna to apply not just to 1981, but also with regard to other civil rights statutes. So I think this case is a major loss with regard to civil rights and civil rights plaintiffs. Hey, thank you, Erwin. And before we get to our last case, just wanna remind everyone um, that you should feel free to pose any questions using the Q&A on Zoom, because we'll get to those right after our final case, which is a turn into criminal law uh, with Ramos versus Louisiana, which was one of only two cases in the entire term in which the Chief Justice was not in the majority. Um, Jeff, can you tell us about Ramos? Uh, happy to, and, and happy that after, uh, the, uh, as this conversation has gone, we can end in a sense on a high note. Um, so Ramos, when we talk about, as, as, as Mike mentioned earlier, all these cases take a village in many ways. And so Ramos versus Louisiana, quite obviously, is a case from Louisiana. And before I talk about it, I just wanted to give a nod to our co-counsel, Ben Cohen, the Promise of Justice Initiative, uh, who really, uh, through just tireless work over, over uh, years and years and years, finally got this issue in front of the justices and was kind enough to ask uh, me and the clinic to be a part of it uh, at the merit stage. Uh, so Ramos arises um, out of a, out of a, in a sense, a uh, special feature of a Louisiana law shared only by one other state, Oregon. Uh, and so uh, many people didn't, didn't even know this, but, but, but um, those are the two states in our country uh, that, until this decision, allowed juries to convict people of crimes by non-unanimous verdicts. Uh, Louisiana adopted its law in 1898 and Oregon uh, in 1933. And I'll say a little bit more in a minute about uh, the, the background of those laws, but they've been around for a very, very long time and they've been exceptional in that no other state has, has adopted a similar law. Uh, and in 1972, kind of in the midst of the incorporation movement in criminal procedure, the court actually took up the question of whether those laws were constitutional. Um, and that question itself really breaks down into two sub-issues. Uh, the first is whether the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial uh, requires uh, a unanimous verdict to convict. And then the second question, remember this was arising during the incorporation era, so all these, so this would have been explicitly asked. The second question is, if that is what the Sixth Amendment requires, does that requirement apply to the states? And in the Apodaca case in 1972, the court split 4-1-4 on these issues. Uh, four justices said that the Sixth Amendment requires unanimous verdict and that that applies to the states by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, four other justices said, we do not think the Sixth Amendment requires unanimous verdict at all. And Justice Powell wrote a separate opinion that broke the tie where he said, I agree uh, that the Sixth Amendment requires a unanimous verdict, but I disagree uh, uh, that the 14th Amendment requires that uh, rule to apply to the states. And so after Apodaca, you had another almost 50 years of these laws remaining on the books uh, and being enforced literally every day in courtrooms across the country. Uh, we got statistics from those, uh, I said across the country, I'm sorry, across those two states. Uh, we got statistics, in fact, saying that uh, roughly half the verdicts uh, in those states uh, were non-unanimous because you could imagine if the jury walks into the box and deliberates for 15 minutes and says we're at 10 to 2 and that's good enough, they don't, uh, they don't have to keep talking. They could just uh, be done at that point. And so after all these years, the court took up the question finally uh, whether, uh, whether Apodaca is correct. And so this was the unusual case on the Supreme Court docket where the express question presented is whether to overrule um, or at least abrogate the holding of the prior case. Um, so we have represented Mr. Ramos and we, uh, uh, we obviously argued uh, 
uh, that the Sixth Amendment as a matter of history and as a matter of just proper functioning uh, should require a unanimous verdict. And that we argue, and we additionally said the court held even before Apodaca, and it has held ever since, uh, that when a uh, rule applies to the federal government by way of the Bill of Rights, it should apply the same way to the states, the most recent example being the Kim's case last term. And so we said, therefore, um, Apodaca cannot be correct, and so uh, you should rule for us. Uh, the state of Louisiana put most of its eggs in the first of those baskets. They argued that the Sixth Amendment does not require unanimity at all. Uh, they did not make a very strong 14th Amendment argument. Uh, and as the justices decided the case, uh, in an opinion that was six, the vote was six to three, um, uh, they held that, in an opinion by Justice Gorsuch, uh, and uh, they held that the Sixth Amendment does in fact require unanimity, primarily as a matter of history. And this is, I think you could think of this in keeping with many Supreme Court decisions recently in the criminal procedure realm, where they've said the historical understanding of a right is embedded into that provision of the Bill of Rights that references it. Uh, and he said, and of course, that has to apply the same way to the states, given what we've said many, many times, including last term. So you might wonder what the dissent said. The dissent was Justice Alito uh, writing for himself and, as Brian said, the Chief Justice, and also uh, Justice Kagan. Uh, and the dissent was primarily uh, based on stare decisis grounds. Uh, the, the dissent says, uh, Apodaca, even if the reasoning doesn't stand the test of time, uh, the holding itself is still entitled to our respect. Uh, and, and in part because of the a special reliance interests that the states have invested in that decision over the years, we should leave it undisturbed. And so I think that leads to the two things that I wanted to highlight about the case that make it, I think, interesting and important going forward. This is not a case like my ministerial exception case I mentioned earlier, where, um, where I think there's going to be a several more cases to work out the meaning. We now know what the rule is and then we're kind of done in that respect, at least with, um, with the exception maybe of a retroactivity question next term. Um, but the two things that kind of rise above the case were one, this question of stare decisis, uh, which, which engendered several separate opinions from different justices. And I think the most notable thing is here is how Justice Kagan and Justice, the Chief Justice we're in dissent in this case on stare decisis grounds. And in fact, we saw that the flip side of that in a later case in the term, also out of Louisiana, June Medical involving abortion rights where they ruled against the state again on stare decisis grounds to strike down a law. And so uh, perhaps the most interesting thing is the fervor with which those two justices seem to be planting a stake in the ground in the stare decisis realm. And then the other thing about the case I wanted to mention quickly uh, before uh, going to questions is that the case was actually briefed and argued and even decided before uh, the George Floyd uh, uh, tragedy and, 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 the, and the current discussion we're having uh, about race in the country. Uh, but race was nevertheless a big deal in this case. Uh, in 1898, Louisiana adopted this, um, this uh, provision as part of its constitutional convention to quote, establish the, uh, establish the supremacy of the white race and the same constitutional convention where they adopted the grandfather clause and the poll tax and the rest. And the Oregon law had a kind of similarly ignominious history. And the court was forthright about that. Justice Gorsuch talked about that in the opening paragraphs of the opinion, how this was a relic of the Jim Crow era. And for that reason, in fact, there was a special urge, I think, on the court's part to stamp it out. Uh, and in reaction, Justice Alito actually took a very uh, strong opposition to talking about race in this way as part of what was really in the in the backdrop of the case and motivating the law. And so you had the court actually talking about race in a, in a more open way than it has sometimes, uh, at least in a case that doesn't directly involve, say, the Equal Protection Clause or a case like Irwin was just talking about. And so it'll be very interesting next term uh, to see if the court kind of picks up where they left off in that res respect and keeps that conversation going. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we've gotten a few questions in so far, um, a couple of which are about the future of DACA and whether the administration has begun efforts to go through the procedures properly as, um, as the court's opinion leaves open and what we might expect or what might be possible before the election and if there's a change in administration. Mike, you want it? 
You want me to take it? No, you go all for right, it. I'll, all right. Um, well, so the public statements from the administration um, certainly sort of lean toward them starting to do something. Um, I, I read the question, I think I saw one person with a question sort of specifically asking, like, is there enough time? And, you know, I think, I think the real question is about the will. Um, you know, there's a story to be told about the DACA cases uh, that that the, that the other that the other point of the litigation, one of the other undercurrents of the litigation, is to hold the administration accountable for its policy choices, rather than them sort of summarily pointing to the law and saying the courts may are making. You know, I love DACA recipients, but the law means I have to get rid of it, right? So, for the, it, there's a I think the, the part of the question is just really about whether or not the administration is willing to thumb its nose at the 80% of Americans that, regardless of party affiliation, support um, documented folks and the pathway to citizenship for them. To stop dodging the question, I unfortunately do think there's probably time to do it before the election. I think it's just a matter of will. Mike, did you or anyone else want to comment on that? No, I think that that uh... That is about right. Right, the president has said and tweeted that uh, he's going to file the paperwork for a new rescission uh, action. That hasn't happened yet, so we'll obviously all be watching that very closely. Great, thanks. Um, so another question is about what we have learned about um, the the balance of power on the court this term. There's been discussion both about how this is now truly the Roberts Court, where the chief is at the center of the court. Um, also some countervailing views, both out of last term and this term, that there are now a, a few potential swing votes, depending on the issue. And uh, so any, any reactions to wh where we are and going forward? I think this term shows that it's truly the Roberts Court. Until a couple of years ago, we said it was the Kennedy Court and Kennedy was the justice most in play. I think that this shows that over and again, it's Roberts. And, and also that this term, Roberts voted differently than in some prior instances. I don't think since he came on the court in 2005, he had ever voted to strike down an abortion law. He was the fifth vote in June Medical Center with regard to gay and lesbian rights, he had dissented in the two marriage equality cases, Wins and Oberfell, but he was part of the majority in Pam's case, Bostock. Um, he wrote the opinion in the DACA case. He wrote the opinion in both of the cases this morning involving subpoenas of records of those who do business with the president. He's not the only justice who can be a swing justice. This morning, Justice Gorsuch joined with the four liberals in an important case about Indian law. But I think that not only is Roberts the swing justice, the median justice ideological in the court, I think he's now going to be the most powerful chief justice we've seen in a very long time, maybe since Earl Warren. Anyone else want to react to that? The, the only thing that I will add, uh, having just talked about a criminal case, is I think everything Irwin said makes a lot of sense. Uh, for most of the court's docket, but I think if you talk to people who are criminal lawyers, they might actually say that Justice Gorsuch is more uh, of a swing vote. And if you look at the past two terms, he has in fact been a more pivotal vote on the court's criminal cases, which is about a quarter to a third of its docket and has you know, a lot of very important um, issues in its own right. So that would be the one, the one uh, nuance I would add to that. Thanks. So the last question that I think we'll have time for picks up on uh, something Jeff was mentioning at the end on the stare decisis question, where there, there's a very heated battle between the, the opinions in, um, in Ramos, which in some ways brings to mind the, the opinions in uh, Irwin's case from last term, Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt, both of which involve slightly esoteric issues, but the court seems to be going all out in a battle over stare decisis, and you wonder if they're thinking of other other fights to come. Um, so you know, the, the specific question we've gotten is on Justice Kagan's vote in particular, and what um, what your thoughts are on her her approach there, and how that's likely to play out. 
I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing about it, which is I think she, she and the Chief Justice are probably the most institutionally conscious justices on the court. Um, and both of them are extremely strategic and very much playing the long game. Um, and which one of them wins that kind of long game may depend on who's on the court for the next 25, 25 years or so. Um, I mean, I sort of had the feeling in Jeff's case, um, in Ramos, um, and I don't know whether Jeff agrees with me, that it was a costless stare decisis vote for her because the court was going to strike down the uh, Oregon and Louisiana laws. I don't know if she, if she would have been the fifth vote to uphold those laws as opposed to the third vote to uphold, uh, uphold those laws. Um, but, you know, obviously she is thinking long term about the extent to which stare decisis allows, you know, the administrative state to go on, which is something none of our cases really uh, touch directly on, but is a major issue in front of the court right now. You know, SALA law was a big question there. Um, you know, Justice Gorsuch has a, has a, I think, a project of dismantling part of the administrative state. Um, and, and those are issues that she cares a lot about and for which stare decisis is going to be essential. So putting it out there as many times as you can in as many different circumstances as you can sort of builds up the stare decisis on stare decisis. I mean, it's kind of meta stare decisis in that sense. Good. Well, thanks, Pam. We are at the end of our hour, so I just want to thank all of the panelists for doing this. Thank you all for joining us for this, and uh, please do stay tuned for an announcement about the ACS um, broader term and review event coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.